Tonight, Jamaica's unique gay rights debate, new drama over the West Side Stadium and Lower Manhattan redevelopment, and New York City's forgotten parks. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Lehrer. We'll jump right in with our first guest. We have with us tonight the chairman of the New York State, uh, I should say the Empire State Development Corporation, appointed by Governor Pataki, Charles Gargano. And he is with us on a day when the governor has announced $800 million in new spending for Lower Manhattan. And that's interesting uh, because Sheldon Silver, the assembly speaker, another of the three most powerful individuals in New York State, had just complained last week that there wasn't enough being done to redevelop Ground Zero, the World Trade Center site, and that we need a Marshall Plan. Interesting that that comes from Shelley Silver, because Shelley Silver is perhaps the last vote they need to approve the West Side Stadium. All of this seems to tie together, and today's events may tie them together even further. So, Chairman Gargano, welcome to Brian Lehrer Live. Thanks for joining us. Nice to be with you, Brian. Uh, let me read from the Crane's New York Business version of what you did today. Details of a plan to spend $800 million in federal aid on redeveloping Lower Manhattan, including Chinatown, were unveiled by Mayor Bloomberg. Um, this includes $24 million for a possible ferry service and street improvements, new security measures and cobblestone paving around the New York Stock Exchange, $32 million toward relocating the police plaza security checkpoint, $7 million in the newly formed Chinatown Partnership Local Development Corporation. Let me put this into plain English. A lot of this money goes into stuff that Sheldon Silver wants for his district. Is that a coincidence? Oh, I think it is. <clears throat> I think it is, Brian. Uh, the governor has uh, talked about uh, <clears throat> his number one uh, priority is Lower Manhattan, the rebuilding of Lower Manhattan. He has been saying that for a long time. Uh, several months ago, he announced that uh, uh, the uh, federal dollars that uh, are available uh, for Lower Manhattan will be identified by uh, the end of April or uh, end of May during that time period. Uh, so this just follows a number of announcements that the governor has recently made, as recent as a week and a half ago in Lower Manhattan when he talked about an additional billion dollars for the Long Island Railroad commuter line coming into Lower Manhattan and many other projects. So I think it, the governor has made it clear all along that he, uh, his, his priority is Lower Manhattan when it comes to projects in New York City. Is this the Marshall Plan? If Sheldon Silver was sitting here, would you say to him, okay, you called for a Marshall Plan for Lower Manhattan redevelopment, here it is? You can call it whatever you want, uh, whatever plan it might be, but it has been the governor's uh, uh, priority all along, uh, and that is to rebuild Lower Manhattan. That has never changed. Was uh, Speaker Silver consulted on this before the announcement. I noticed the announcement today came in his district, in Chinatown, mm -hmm. with the governor, but Silver was not there. Well, I, I can't say. I, I, the governor does speak to uh, Speaker Silver uh, many, many times uh, on many matters related to New York City and New York State, of course. Uh, he is the speaker. I cannot tell you if they had a personal discussion about this today. But uh, to me, uh, this is just one of a series of announcements that the governor has been making about uh, assistance to rebuild Lower Manhattan. Now, I heard that this is the last $800 million of the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation money. Did I get that right? That's correct. And yes. so do they go out of business after this? Oh, no, they do not go out of business. Uh, what they will be doing is uh, the focus will be on the memorial, of course, because the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey has the responsibility uh, with uh, the developer, Larry Silverstein, who uh, signed a 99-year net lease with the Port Authority only uh, weeks before September 11th of 2001. Uh, so uh, these are the federal funds that uh, Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, the subsidiary of Empire State Development Corporation, had. And the governor has been talking, as I said a few moments ago, that these uh, uh, monies, uh, dollars would be identified and would be uh, uh, mentioned by the governor, uh, announced by the governor, uh, 
at the end of April or sometime in May. And here it is. And here it is. Let me go over a few <clears> of these <throat> things that our viewers might find interesting. $24 million will fund a possible ferry service from where to where? Well, we're talking about, uh, I, I wasn't there this morning for that announcement. I had a conflict. But uh, we're talking about uh, ferry service uh, from Manhattan to different parts of, uh, of this area, perhaps the John F. Kennedy Airport, up the Hudson River uh, to uh, uh, locations uh, north of, uh, of Manhattan, but it's for additional ferry service in general. Going to Lower Manhattan. Or going, going to, oh, to all going Manhattan. to Lower, the destination be Lower Manhattan, of course. Um, I see on the Newsday version the announcement included affordable housing. Do you know how much affordable housing and specifically where? Uh, no, I don't have the details of what the governor announced this morning, as I said. Uh, the one thing I did know is that the disbursement of the remaining federal funds were to be made around this time, and it was not uh, coordinated with the recent events uh, uh, with uh, Speaker Silva. Are you more confident because of this announcement today than you were yesterday that Speaker Silva will vote yes on the West Side Stadium? I cannot speak for uh, Speaker Silva. I hope he does see the, uh, the, the merits of, uh, of the project, the importance of the project. Uh, this is an expansion of Javits to the south, which will include a stadium where the private sector will invest $1 billion, not taxpayer money. Uh, and we will have uh, not only expanding Javits north, which we're beginning the process as we speak, but also we'll be able to expand Javits south and have a 180,000 square foot exhibit hall when the Jets are not playing. Let's keep it in proper perspective. The Jets are going to be playing eight to ten games per year. And then perhaps we'll have another half a dozen events which New York City cannot host today, such as the Super Bowl, a Final Four, and, and some other major events. Uh, we're talking about 16 events per year, and the remainder of the time we will use that facility uh, for Javits uh, trade shows and, and conventions. Let me list <clears throat> Excuse me for you. Some of the things that Speaker Sil Silver said he wants for downtown, which were not included in the announcement today, he wants the Pataki administration and the Port Authority, according to the New York Times, to pledge to lease an entire new building on the World Trade Center site. Are you prepared to make such a pledge? Well, I think the governor has has said uh, for many for months and months that. Uh, that uh, his office will go to the uh, World Trade Center site. He his will office, the governor's that, office. Right, but that's not the same as a whole building. Well, when I, I don't know about a whole building, uh, depending. Are you talking about World Trade Center 7? Are you talking about the Freedom Tower? Well, what I have here is that he said the governor, uh, the administration, and the Port Authority should pledge to lease an entire new building on the World Trade well, first Center of all, site. I, lease it themselves. Uh, first of all, the Port Authority and their needs, square footage wise, and a governor's uh, office and and uh, whatever is practical, well, other agencies I don't think could fill up an entire building, depending on what building you're talking about. Uh, but I think the governor has made a commitment. Uh, it was uh, also very symbolic for other agencies to follow, including the Port Authority. So this is not anything new. The governor has mentioned this uh, over the last uh, six months. So that's, that's a no on that particular um, demand of Sheldon Silvers. What about eliminating the commercial rent tax downtown, which he's also asked for, and expanding an existing incentive program to lure companies to the area? Again, the summary from the New York well, Times. Well, we have uh, we have many programs to lure companies lure companies to Lower Manhattan. Empire State Development has been using these programs uh, since right after September 11th of uh, uh, nearly four years ago. So we have uh, many many programs that are over and beyond, uh, Brian, the normal traditional programs we have in New York State. So there is clearly uh, a focus on, on providing all of these added benefits for companies to locate in Lower Manhattan. And what about the commercial rent tax for downtown? Well, that, that's something that will have to be taken up, uh, uh, taken up by the legislature. Uh, I mean, if, if you're going to uh, pass a law, it has to be approved by the legislature. That's not something that we have the authority to do, meaning Empire State Development. You have a role in both these projects, the West Side Stadium and Lower Manhattan Redevelopment. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg has said that the West Side Redevelopment is the most important redevelopment plan going on for the long-term future of the city right now. Speaker Silver took great umbrage at that and said Lower Manhattan is really the future of Manhattan and is emotionally the right thing to pay attention to uh, as well after 9-11. Do you take uh, the mayor's side or Sheldon Silver's side? Well, I, it's, I'm not... T taking anyone's side. I think the mayor of the city of New York, Mayor Bloomberg, is looking at the city and the, what his priorities are. I can only speak for the state of New York, the governor of the state of New York, Empire State Development, and state agencies know 
that uh, the governor's priority is lower Manhattan when it comes to New York City projects? Um, one of uh, Silver and Joe Bruno, the state Senate majority leader's concerns, is the nature of some of the financing for the stadium, including the diversion of $450 million in property taxes that would otherwise go to city services. Are they right to be concerned about that? And tell the taxpayers who are watching us tonight why that's a better use of their property tax dollars uh, than funding health care or education or any other of the day-to-day -day city well, services. Well, first of all, speaking for the state of New York, uh, our commitment is $300 million towards the project, and the city of New York's commitment is $300 million. That's a total of $600 million that we are capped at. Uh, the Jets will be spending uh, nearly $1 billion. Uh, we're talking about, from the state point of view, the $300 million, we will issue bonds. And those bonds will, are specific for the project. They cannot be used, Brian, for all of the things that you just mentioned. They are project-specific. And secondly is the income coming in from uh, that particular uh, uh, project to the south will, more, will be more than uh, what we need to pay off the bonds, and there will be profits involved uh, additional revenue, unrealized revenue to the to the state. Uh, of course, in addition to that, um, we have a multiplier effect, and that is that uh, there is a, a lot more economic development that will be created as a result of having this expansion of Javits South and the stadium as well. I want to show our viewers some video of the West Side Stadium uh, as it's proposed. This is an animation in just a minute, but before we see it and have you walk us through it a little bit, why should, on principle, the taxpayers of New York City and New York State spend one dime of tax money to subsidize a billionaire who owns a sports entertainment business, the New York Jets? Can't he build his own stadium if he wants to play his games in Manhattan? Well, he can build his own stadium, and that does not give us the opportunity to use the facility for Javits conventions and trade shows. What we're doing, we're making a $600 million investment to city and state. As I, as I said before, the uh, unrealized revenue that will come from this new facility will more than pay for our investment. And we, that's what we have to look at it as though we are making an investment. When we invested hundreds of millions of dollars on 42nd Street to rebuild 42nd Street, we are realizing a lot of new revenue for city and state. Uh, and there was $2 billion in private sector investment uh, took place there. So we have to look at, at it as an investment. Uh, that's number one. And, and so, as you said, if the Jets wanted to build their own stadium, we would not have use of that facility, and we will have, the city and state, the greater use of the multi-use uh, facility than the Jets will. All right, let's roll this video. Let's show our viewers at home a little bit of what this stadium and its environs might look like. Take a look at that and explain to us what we're seeing right now. Well, what you're looking at there is the, the stadium, uh, uh, obviously, with a corridor coming down uh, near 34th Street. Uh, the stadium is a rectangular structure. Uh, as you can see, it does not have great height to it, so it will not block views from east to west uh, looking towards the uh, Hudson River. In addition to that, it will have a, a, a very, very a pleasing to the eye um, fascia around the structure. And then, of course, within, uh, it'll be a sports arena. And when they're not playing football, it'll be a retractable dome that will cover. It'll be uh, roofed, in other words. And then we can use that as the exhibit hall for Javits events. And I think that's what is the most important thing. Uh, I, our estimate is that we can use it for maybe 125 days per year for these uh, Javits activities. And the Jets will be using it for eight games per year and perhaps two additional if they're in the playoffs. And then another half a dozen, and there's the retractable roof as I talked about, and now it becomes an exhibit hall. Uh, so that's, uh, in my opinion, a win-win situation, uh, situation. It's a great use of a facility. And when you think about that the public sector, city and state, are investing only $600 million compared to $1 billion from the private sector, I think we're getting a bargain. All right. So there is some video. And I, I want, let's, let's just stay with this for a second because we're going to see the outside. There, I guess, is a concert hall configuration. That's correct. And there's the outside. You may think of a stadium as round, but this is, uh, looks square in that shot. It's really rectangular. That's, co that's correct. And you can see the connection with the Javits Center there just north. We'll have an underground connection to the existing Javits. All right. Uh, so that's the video. I think we'll uh, come back to the studio now. 
and I saw on there NYC 2012, and some people would say, in your dreams or wishful thinking. Do you think it's been smart to couple the pitch to the public for the stadium with the Olympic bid? Doesn't it create an artificial deadline? And doesn't it ratchet up the pressure on the public to think, God, they're trying to use the Olympics to sell me this stadium. I don't even know if it's a good idea or a bad idea, but it, it just doesn't seem to, to be necessary for the Olympics. Well, Brian, I think I just uh, hopefully described <clears throat> the long-term use of this facility. It's not only for the Olympics, but of course, as the International Olympic Committee uh, Evaluation Committee that was here uh, uh, two months ago has said that it is important that New York City demonstrate that there will be a stadium for the Olympics uh, if, uh, if indeed uh, New York City is going to be considered. So the Olympics are, uh, are important for New York 2012. It will bring a lot of economy and tourists from around the world to New York City. But I also want to emphasize that this is a long-range project beyond 2012. It's a project that we will use for Javits uh, shows and uh, trade shows and conventions, as I said before. It will bring us uh, uh, events that we cannot handle here in New York City today, like a Super Bowl and a Final Four and others. So it goes beyond the Olympics. But certainly, uh, I wouldn't minimize uh, the, if New York is going to be competitive and try to win the Olympics, certainly demonstrating that we have a stadium is important. How about Queens for a stadium for the Jets and the Olympics. It would have been less contentious. I, I would guess if you put a stadium in Queens, which is you know probably the most diverse county in the history of humankind, everybody would be talking about what a global city New York is instead of what a political rat's nest it is. Well, first of all, I think what you have to think about is uh, the investor, the private sector investor. Where they invest a billion dollars in Queens, and I think Queens is a great borough. I grew up in Brooklyn; it's a great borough. Uh, the fact is that the private sector uh, <clears throat> has chosen the West Side to invest $1 billion. Secondly is, again, this is an expansion of Javits. Javits is on the West Side. So if we built this facility in Queens, if, a, if someone from the private sector wanted to do that, there is no way that we can make it an annex of the existing convention center on the West Side of Manhattan. Um, Charles Gargano, my guest for another few minutes, chairman of the Empire State Development Corporation. Our phone number is on your screen, 212-251-0801. Uh, I want to get back to Lower Manhattan. We've talked a little bit about Sheldon Silver, the Assembly Speaker. I want to play you a clip of what he said on Gabe Pressman News Forum on Sunday. I, I think there are questions that have to be answered about it. The most specific question that I can uh, tell your viewers is, what is the public cost of this stadium? How much will the public lay out in order to have the Jets play on the west side of Manhattan. Okay, so Sheldon Silver once again asking how much is the public going to lay out? And there does seem to be some confusion about this. You say $600 million, mm -hmm. like, <clears throat> like that's a, a known number, $300 million from the state. If the control board votes yes, $300 million from the city. Um, but the question that Silver and Bruno seem to have still has to do with this money that would be diverted to financing the debt on the bonds. And that's a little confusing for the average person who's not, uh, you know, a, a bonds and, and bond debt expert. But there seems to be some uncertainty there, according to a lot of people. Well, it's not uncertainty. I think any project that's built, there is a, a, a phase value of what it's going to cost. Then there is uh, interest costs as well. But I think we also have to consider, Brian, the income stream, the new revenue stream that comes from a project like this. So therefore, uh, you, know, you have to look at the entire picture. We have said before uh, on many occasions that we have had financial studies done by professionals in this area, and we will have uh, unrealized income greater than the cost to pay off the bonds, including the interest that uh, is being discussed. So, so my position is just a good enough investment that whatever debt the taxpayers in effect take on it's going to be more than paid off even though other people say stadiums around the country traditionally have been white elephants we have no, we're not building the stadium uh, the jets That's not are a paying, stadium? the it's it's a multi-use facility it's a, a new york convention and sports facility it is going to be used i'm trying i've tried to make this point for the last six or eight <laughs> months 
and that is, and I'll say it again, we're going to be using this facility most of the time for Javits trade shows and conventions. We are not building a stadium. The Jets are spending up to $1 billion for a stadium that will be housed within this multi-use facility. If you get the business to go there, and I guess a lot of people think that, that that's a question, how many non-football events are you actually going to attract going to attract in a year, and there are all these competing estimates about Well, that. first of all, I can tell you that Javits, uh, uh, our convention center is uh, number 18th or 19th in the country in size. I understand that last year they turned away 53 different conventions and shows. There's a tremendous demand for convention space, uh, so I don't believe that would be a problem. Uh, in fact, uh, the Javits Operating Corporation has told us that they desperately need more space. And this 180,000 square feet to the south certainly would be welcomed by them. Let's take a phone call for you. Here's Mary on the Lower East Side. Hi, you're on Brian Lear Live. Thanks for calling. Uh, hello. I was just concerned about that. Uh, I've heard that uh, land may be taken for various projects uh, by eminent domain. Um, there's, I've heard a lot of talk about eminent domain uh, abuse, actually. Uh, in New York State, and I wonder if Mr. Gargano had any comments on that. Right. Now, eminent domain, of course, is when the government takes land from private individuals because they say it's so important for a public purpose. That's not involved with the West Side or with Lower Manhattan, is it? Uh, no, it is not. Uh, but that's a very good question. Uh, we, we are very careful when we use powers of eminent domain or condemnation of properties. We have to demonstrate that it's for the public good. As an example, we used our powers of condemnation on 42nd Street, where we had a lot of, uh, you know, um, illicit drugs going on and peep sh uh, shops and all of those uh, uh, tri uh, triple and uh, quadruple X uh, uh, theaters. So what we wanted to do is clean up 42nd Street. And we use powers of eminent domain to do that. We condemned the properties, took them over, took all of those shops uh, and distributed them and moved them out of the area. And then the city of New York passed a, another law uh, saying that they couldn't be within 500 feet of each other. We cleaned up the street. It has to be used for a public purpose. But before we go, um, the governor appointed his chief of staff, Kevin Cahill, to take over the John Cahill. John Cahill, forgive me, to take over the downtown yes. redevelopment um, uh, presidency from Kevin Rampey. Mr. Ca Cahill has canceled the contract with the company in charge of demolishing the Deutsche Bank building. Uh, this is the one that people may have seen ominously draped in black all this time downtown. Why was that contract canceled and what's going to happen next? Uh, there were, uh, what's going to happen uh, next? First of all, the company that was uh, working on, uh, on the decontamination of the building before it would be uh, demolished uh, was not hired by, uh, by the Port Authority or the State of New York or LMDC. It came with Deutsche Bank. Uh, that was part of, uh, it, it transferred that when we acquired the Deutsche, Deutsche Bank, they came along with them. Uh, at this point in time, we thought uh, for, uh, for the future and trying to expedite the process, we will put on an RFP. And, and select uh, someone to come in there and, uh, uh, and to, to uh, clean up the building, decontaminate the building, and demolish it. And that choice was made, uh, that decision was made, I should say, recently, to try and encourage more competition and get more people involved on how to demolish that building uh, more efficiently and, and quicker. Perhaps the biggest downtown problem is Goldman Sachs wavering now on whether they're going to build that new headquarters downtown and stay there. Um, is this a failure of the LMDC uh, and, by extension, the governor's office, that Goldman Sachs, which said they were going to stay downtown and which was going to be a real anchor tenant for continuing, uh, you know, the, the financial district as the financial district, really? Uh, and what do you think the prospects are for retaining them? Well, I hope that Goldman Sachs will, uh, will see the benefits of being in Lower Manhattan. Uh, certainly, uh, we have uh, listened to their concerns. Uh, one of the proposals uh, uh, was being considered for West Street, the West Side Highway, was a tunnel. Uh, they were concerned about the, the uh, portal of the tunnel uh, on the north end being in front of their building. Uh, the governor, uh, four weeks ago, uh, made a decision that we will not use that particular uh, uh, scenario for, for uh, Westway. Uh, we will, uh, the West Side Highway, I should say, West Street. Um, and that it will be a boulevard type. We hope that will alleviate their concerns. 
Uh, we have uh, dealt with, uh, with the Goldman Sachs for uh, one year, providing some very strong uh, benefits to them. And I hope that they will reconsider. And uh, they are thinking about it as we speak. But we have done everything possible to encourage uh, Goldman Sachs to locate in Lower Manhattan at Site 26 at Battery Park. Empire State Development Corporation Chairman Charles Gargano, thank you very much Good for to be joining with you, Brian. us. We really Good. appreciate it. And coming up next, Jamaica's unique gay rights debate with performance artist Stacey Ann Chin. This is Brian Lehrer Live. Uh, hello. Uh, yes. Can I ask a few questions about the apartment on Park Street? What was your name? Is my name. Uh, my name is Juan Hernandez. It's been rented. Oh, it's gone. Hello. My name is Sanjay Kumar. I am calling about the apartment on Park Street. It's not available. Not available? Hello. My name is Tyrone Washington. I'm calling about the apartment on Park Street. It's just been rented. Hello. I am Chen Ling. My name is Khalid Bin Ali. I'm Tuan Vo. Hello. My name is Moshe Goldberg. I use a wheelchair. It's gone. Not available. All right. Thank you. Yes, hello. My name is Graham Wellington. I'm calling about the apartment for rent on Park Street. Is that still available? Yes, it is. Oh, it is? Yes. Really? Housing discrimination is illegal. If you think you've been a victim because of your race, color, national origin, sex, religion, disability, or family status, call us. Fair housing. It's not an option. It's the law. Prominent professors, outstanding students, illustrious alumni, all on the Emmy-nominated magazine show about CUNY. Hi, I'm Dwayne Ferguson. Join us every week as we bring you stories about the people and programs that make CUNY a place where you study with the best. Coming up later, the forgotten parks of New York City. What's broken, ugly, or dangerous in your local park will take your calls. But first, Jamaica's unique gay rights debate. Stacey Ann Chin is several unremarkable things for New York City, Jamaican immigrant, performer, lesbian, half Chinese. But taken together, she is unusual indeed. We'll talk to her about her work and about why Jamaica is arguably the most homophobic culture in the Caribbean. The inspiration for this segment, this front page story in the newspaper Caribbean Life. It's about dueling protests at the Jamaican consulate in New York last month. It's about the debate in Jamaica over anti-sodomy laws that apply to gay men. It's about gay bashing. It tells us that gay male sex is illegal in Jamaica, but lesbian sex is not. So in that context, we'll talk to Stacey Ann Chen about life between New York and Jamaica. First, let's take a look at a sample of her poetry on stage. Every day I know what I want to be now. I want to be that voice that makes Giuliani so scared he hires two black bodyguards. I want to write the poem that the New York Times will not print because it might start some kind of black or lesbian or even a white revolution. I want to go to secret meetings and under the guise of female friendship, I want to beg the women of those young and eager revolutionaries with too much zeal for their cause and too little passion for the women who follow them from city to city, all the while waiting in separate rooms. I want to be 40 years old and 300 pounds and ride a motorcycle in the winter time with hell raising children and a 110 pound female lover who writes poetry about my life and my children and loves me like no one has ever loved me before. I want to be that girl your parents will use as a bad example of a lady. I want to be the dyke who likes to f men. I want to be the politician who never ever lies. I want to be that girl who never cries. I want to go down in history in a chapter marked miscellaneous because the writers could find no other way to categorize me. In this world where classification is key, let me erase the straight lines so I can be me. 
Stacey Ann Chin on stage. <laughs> Stacey Ann Chin in our studio. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Is that as intense as you get? Um, <laughs> yes, maybe. Yes. Mostly, yes, not entirely. Mostly, yes. Yes. On television, that's intense as you're going to get, right? Yes. yes. Uh, and those are your goals and desires as a poet? Are I you? Think, I think um, there are more, but perhaps for that moment, th those, <laughs> those were they. Are you achieving them? Um, most of them, yes, and, and a couple of others. Have, have you written that poem that might start the revolution? No, I'm still working on it. You know, I think I'm, you know, we work on working, I'm working on parts of the revolution. So we start a little bit on the east side, a little bit in Brooklyn, you know, a little bit in the Bronx. And, and, and the last line there was, let me erase the straight line so I can be me. Does yes. everyone impose those lines, you know, right and left and gay and straight and Jamaican and Chinese and white, everybody? I think the lines shift depending on where you are. My biggest problem is with the people who are um, tied to the idea of lines. I think I reserve the right to be anything that I want to be on any given day, and I think that's what I fight for when I speak out. Okay, now we have a little bit more of that same poem, and I think people are sufficiently intrigued by seeing that first clip. Let's see where else <laughs> this goes. Today, I want to write from a place where I change lives and change people and places, cross over boundaries of sexes and cultures and races, paint the skies deep red instead of boring blue, write the true histories of me and you, crawl deep inside the lines of every poem that I write. I want to speak about the stars as if I had become the night. Tonight. I want to be intimate with my muse. Hell, I want to bed the woman. I want to have her so close that she gets up inside of me so that when I'm asleep, she can rouse me. No, I want her to arouse me, have her way with me, have her play with me, so that when I wake up, I will be inspired to write honest poems. Poems about grandmothers and babies and truth. Poems that don't care about the meter or the rhyme. Poems that couldn't give a flying fuck about the time. Poems that are written in blood, flowing straight from the heart. Poems that will not sit within the squares of any chart. I want to write. I left my lover and now I want her back poems. I miss Jamaica, but I'm never going back poems. I know it's not a 10, but it sends shivers down my back poems. Poems that reveal the flaws that make up strikingly real people. Real poems. And what you couldn't see at home is that Stacey Ann in the studio was mouthing the words along. That's a lot to memorize. It's, it, it's not really. I mean, you know, it's no less than what, you know, Broadway performers or people who have, you know, entire shows for an hour and a half. That's true. There's memorize. a lot of memorization. And, yeah. But you have to memorize not just the lines, but also the rhythm, because obviously the rhythms matter a lot there. Actually, they don't so much. I mean, I think they just kind of fall into the natural rhythm of how I speak, mm -hmm. you know, which, you know, because this, this is, the media particularly is such a hegemonic um, thing, I'm exotic and therefore, you know, they use words like lilting and uh, musical and, you know, maybe you're a lilting and musical to me. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I hope so. Um, and so after you write, do you yes. then kind of walk around your living room and recite and recite and recite and recite until you get it down? I think there was a time when I did that. These days... Um, I write and then I read so much in so many different places that it, the poem actually finds its rhythm with an audience, you know, where, most times. Where in Jamaica are you from? I was born in Montego Bay and I was raised in Montego Bay and I actually um, kind of um, went to the university when I was about 20 or so. And for our viewers who've never been to Montego Bay, what's it like there? Um, it's tourist land, you know, it's that, you know, beach and, you know, most of it is taken up or, so, or the local culture is sustained by the tourist industry. So there are hotels everywhere and there are people who put on a very fake accent and tell you, I remain, everything is okay, no problem, you know, to get you to leave that magical U.S. dollar with them. Were there out gays and lesbians around when you were growing up? No. No, not at all. I mean, you know, hands down, you know. Was there no. a community um, underground? I think that there has always been. I think that there isn't a culture that does not have an underground gay lesbian community. Um, sometimes they're more underground in the church than anywhere else. But it wasn't um, in the news. It wasn't kind of in the culture. No, no. I had never heard it spoken out loud when I was a child. So much so that when I actually came to the place where I, you know, I said to myself, you know, I like girls more than I like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I said to myself, you know, I, I, I had to search for the words that would describe what it was and, you know. Yeah. So who did you first come out to? Um, I think I first came out to the, um, you see, these are very personal questions now. You don't have to, <laughs> no, you no, don't no, have no. to tell me. Um, I, I, I think I came out to, you know, like 
other people around me like who were in the arts and you know I kind of but I kind of said it because I didn't think anything was kind of really wrong with it you know yeah you said uh, it's you said with a, a smile a minute ago it's uh, perhaps hidden underground more in the church than anywhere else You're talking about the Catholic Church none I, I think any church I mean I think I think um you know, if you're if you're if you're young and you're single and you're like, okay, I'm, I want to give my life to God. I don't want to do anything else with my life. I think it's, the church is a safe place to say that, and nobody won't ask you any. Nobody will ask you any questions about you know if that's really true because you know. Why did you decide to come to New York? Because it's um, illegal to be homosexual in Jamaica, and more than it is illegal, it is um, a kind of um, the, the social punishment for being gay is dramatic and difficult and the violence against people who identify as gay you know um, as gay or lesbian it's it's so horrid that I knew that the kind of life that I wanted to lead as an out lesbian could not happen in Jamaica and um, the summer before I moved here I had come to New York and of course walked through the village and saw and thought oh my god this is where I belong. <laughs> really, and is um, is that true for lesbians as well as gay men that there's a lot of violence? There is. Um, I, it's a very interesting thing because the minute you um, you say that you are, the minute you say that you are a lesbian, most men in almost any culture, and particularly the Jamaican culture, I don't mind that. That's very good. I like that. That's interesting. Oh, I love lesbians. I can't stand gay men, but I love lesbians. But the minute you make it up very clear that your space as a lesbian is closed to them, then it gets kind of very personally violent. And they kind of, you know, like, how dare you refuse me? And it get, becomes, it turns into things like rape and bashing, you know, physical bashing. And we can't take phone calls tonight for Stacey Ann Chin. You see the number on your screen, 212-251-0801. Maybe any other Jamaicans, gay or straight, or anyone else, 212-251-0801. Now let me ask you to play reporter for us yes. for, for a minute. And I know you were just in Jamaica last week. In and I'm fact, going back tomorrow. <laughs> oh, good. And, and some of the viewers will remember we had you scheduled for last week's show, and, and then you went back because you had to go back. Mm -hmm. But um, why is this in the news? Why, why is the, the whole topic of homosexuality in the news in Jamaica right now? I think that um, there are a number of factors. I think that the, um, according to our present prime minister, the bullies from the north you know, the likes of the Human Rights Watch, etc., Amnesty International, they're breathing down the Jamaican government's neck. But the Jamaican government still is saying in a very official way, the bullies from the north will not come down here to Jamaica to tell us how to handle or rapists or murderers and or homosexuals. Uh, so it's, um, it's, but there's a particular law, right? There's a legal yes. debate. Yes. They're thinking of what? Repealing the anti-sodomy law? They're not thinking of anything. There are people lobbying the government to begin the conversation to maybe look at that law, but the government still has not sat down with anyone. You know, this is all just conversation in the media. I think we're in the very early stages. We're kind of, um, you know, pre-Stonewall, a couple of years pre-Stonewall in Jamaica. You know, we are, we're there and, you know, conversations are happening. It's in the news. People are coming out. The conversations are very topical around homosexuality, but there are no laws. There, there are no conversations going on with the lawmakers. Pre-Stonewall. Stonewall in New York. Those riots were 1969. Yes. So you're pre-1969. In terms Jamaica. of the homosexual debate, I think, in Jamaica. Yeah. Um, now, from what I read in that issue of Caribbean life, mm -hmm. um, the law makes it illegal for gay men mm -hmm. to practice sex, but not for lesbian women. Which is, you know, deeply rooted in the idea of the invisibility of the woman's body. So, um, you know, you know, because we don't have a penis, so to speak, you know, um, you know, and I won't even, okay, uh, because we don't have a penis, I, they, then, then sex can't be possible between us, you know. And so there's no reason to address, or you're just women, so there's no reason to even address you in the law, is it sexist at that level? I think so, yes. Um, and particularly around the idea of sex, you know, like sex can't happen without a man's body. Let's take a phone call for you, and this is Andrea in East New York. Hi, you're on Brian Lair Live with Stacey Ann Chin. Hi, good evening. How are you? Good, good. Stacey Ann, I, as a black West Indian female, want to comment, commend you. And I saw you at the Deaf Poetry Jam on Broadway approximately two years ago, and when I saw you, I was so taken aback, and I loved your poetry. Your voice brings forth all the truth inside of you. I 
was amazed to hear your Jamaican accent and you actually praised the lesbianism. You so went against the norm. And I'm like pumping my fist right now saying, you go, girl. <laughs> Not only do I love poetry, but to hear another West Indian woman speak her mind. I myself am not a lesbian, but I, you spoke your mind. You are not hiding behind anything. You let it out. And I was so fortunate to sit in the front row and I felt your spirit. It's and very I kind of you, you to say that. Thank you. So, I mean, I praise you and I want to say you keep doing what you're doing. And that's right. right. You let everyone know from Jamaica to Kingstown, everywhere. You let them know not only are you a poet, a bright young black woman, but you're also a lesbian and you can keep <laughs> taking that beer. <laughs> All right. She's ready to follow in your footsteps, I think. Well, well, well. Thank you so much, Andrea. <laughs> Thank you. Very well, then, uh, on, with that as an introduction, why don't we watch one more clip of <laughs> Stacey Ann Chin on stage. I want to stop writing poor excuses for poems that do nothing but stroke my ego and fool the crowd into thinking my bucking and screaming is their orgasm. I don't want to join the staged revolution. Don't want to be a part of some spotlight slamming solution. Don't want to go to Austin or Chicago simply because I think I have the rapidly moving metaphors smashing off the New York walls or similes like a silver bullet beelining for the finals on a balloon full of nothing but hot air making the room smell like a fart from a bad poem that somebody should have said excuse me for. You turned your wrath on yourself there a little bit, didn't you? Um, well, you know, if you can't, if you can't stand on your own <laughs> sledgehammer, you shouldn't swing it. Let's take another phone call. We have James in Brooklyn. Hi, James. You're on Brian Lair Live. Yeah. Um, this is for Tuesday. Hello? Yes, go ahead, James. I can you're hear on, you. You're on the air. Go ahead. Yeah, Tuesday. And if you, if you gay or that's your lifestyle, mm -hmm. You are at the right place. You, know, you just stay in New York and be gay. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. But I don't think nobody has the right to try to pressure Jamaica to legalize that kind of lifestyle. You know? And for the next thing they got to think about, they got to think about the revolution it's going to cause in order for them to do such thing in Jamaica. The amount of lives it going to cause. You see what I'm saying? So, James, so can I ask you? A few people. James, uh, listen for a second. James? Go ahead. Go ahead. Can I ask you um, what happens to the people who can't come to New York? What? The people who don't have a visa right. to come to New York. What about those people in Jamaica? Well, look here. If it wasn't for, for influence for play, from places like this, they wouldn't be gay in Jamaica, Pira. You see what I'm saying? So you think that if people it, wouldn't be gay if there wasn't no, an American people, influence? No, because people don't bond gay. That's oh, I see. Oh, I see. Yeah. All right, J James, we're going to move on from there. But this is a typical attitude. <laughs> this is in the Jamaica? typical. I'm so glad James called. I love James. <laughs> you know, because people would think I'm lying. <laughs> so thank you, James. Aisha in Harlem. You're on Brian Lair live with Stacey Ann Chin. Hello. Hi, Stacey. My name is Aisha. Hi, hi um, Aisha. How are you? I love your work. I've seen you live on Deaf Poetry Jam. My question is, in terms of the debate, um, you being a Jamaican woman, a woman of African descent, the whole debate around the origin of homosexuality, um, I've heard people say that there is no homosexuality in Africa. It didn't originate in Africa. It's actually a European uh, construct. Um, but I have been doing work with uh, Maladoma Some, who has the uh, um, brilliant, um, is bringing forth the brilliant idea that homosexuality is, does exist in Africa and is a very ancient practice. So just in terms of, of what you're doing, how do you deal with the fact that Jamaicans and people of African descent try to demonize homosexuality and say that it's not uh, is not original to African people. Stacey, go um, ahead. Well, uh, it's a very interesting thing. You know, every culture is claiming that, um, that, that homosexuality did not exist there prior to uh, an American influence or a European incident or influence. Or, um, but you just, I, I think it is irrelevant, you know, where it began, although it's kind of stupid. I mean, like, where did, hom where did heterosexuality begin? Well, the, under the underlying assumption there is that homosexuality is culturally constructed to begin with, right. rather than biologically constructed. Sexuality, so that, you know, the, the question, I mean, to think, that, as you said, it begs the question of sexuality being culturally specific or culturally contained. But 
where did, okay, and if it is so, where did <laughs> heterosexuality begin? You know, in what culture? I mean, is that a European thing or is that an African thing? Um, for the most part, I think, you know, sexuality, you know, the thing about me that makes me prefer or not prefer or act in a way that is sexually this way or that way, I think it is irrelevant. I think it is very much a personality thing, a thing that happens... You know, I, I think it's no more important than whether I'm talkative or, or an introvert or an extrovert. We're, we're just about out of time, but mm. why do you think that Jamaica, by all accounts, is the most homophobic country in the Caribbean? I think we have the most churches per square mile in the world. And I think we are probably one of the poorest countries of <clears throat> the world. You know, I think that when you boil, you know, post-colonialism and racism and poverty and... Uh, um, and, and, and violence and religion all in the same pot. Mm -hmm. I think you come up with a, a number of, you know, um, of, of ways of thinking that might be harmful to the, to the, to the residents who live there. And may I? Real quick. Okay. Um, Border Clash, new show opens at um, 45 Bleecker. Uh, previews begin on the 3rd, opening night the 16th. You can go to StaceyAnchin.com for information. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you. I Thanks had a for great coming time. in. Me too. Thanks a lot. Well, coming up next, New York City's Forgotten Parks. This is Brian Lehrer Live. And so we arrived. We didn't ask to be here. Let's say it just happened. But now we are here, a word in your ear. We don't want your sympathy. We are stronger than you think. We don't want your tears. We are the river of our own. We can do without cynicism, indifference, and abuse. We are not the problem. We are the solution. We'll soon be the future. But right now we are the present. And in truth, we want for only one thing, your consideration. We are children. Don't treat us like kids. You were once us. Give us the chance to become you. Hi, I'm Matthew Goldstein. New Yorkers are choosing CUNY colleges in record numbers. CUNY has a world-class faculty and state-of-the-art facilities. Come visit our campuses located in every borough. Talk with career advisors and financial aid experts. Contact us at cuny.edu or call us at 1-800-CUNY-S. CUNY will invest in your future. Invest in CUNY now. Well, some parks have, have a lot of private money, Bryant Park, Central Park. You've heard about the Central Park Conservancy. A lot of parks don't have a lot of money. Did you see the cover of Newsday on Monday? Rich Park, Poor Park. What a disparity there is in New York City between some parks and certain other parks. We're going to talk about that with two guests, and we're going to talk about the community gardens. There was a great event in the East Village over the weekend, and we're going to roll some tape right now as we introduce our guests, uh, Nikki Traino, who is um, with the, let's see, what's the, what's the exact name of the group? We're Earth? called Earth Celebrations. Earth Celebrations, which is, which is a great name. And Rob Polner uh, is a Newsday correspondent who wrote this story. Now, let's take a look at what happened along the lines of the Earth Celebration in the East Village on Sunday. Nikki, what are we looking at here? Okay, we're looking at the 15th Annual Rights of Spring Procession. These are puppets and costumes that have been made in the community, by the community, with our uh, workshops that are offered to people in the Lower East Side in the East Village. Uh, we have children's performances. These are all to commemorate uh, the gardens in the Lower East Side in the East Village that have been saved um, uh, in the last 15 years. And we're going to see some of those gardens in a couple of minutes. But, you know, I know a guy who says he likes community gardens because they're quiet. This parade made them noisy and made them stay away. What does this contribute? Okay. This is, this is really our, our way of raising, uh, yeah, raising attention publicly about the gardens, the fact that they still need to be saved. Um, these are our high school students from all over element, um, 
Queens, Brooklyn, all of Manhattan that come and see the gardens. A lot of people don't Great really masks. know that they're there. Thank you. All right, and there they are. Let's bring it back to the studio. Tell us a little bit of this history. What are you celebrating? Community gardens were in the news a lot in the 1980s mm -hmm. when they seemed particularly threatened. We don't hear that much about them anymore. What's the status of community gardens in the East Village or citywide? All right. In the Lower East Side, um, in the last 15 years, they've, they've been um, They've really made it an, uh, an approach to be saved. Uh, during the Giuliani administration, there had been a great amount of problems. Um, uh, Bette Midler and the philanthropic community had come together uh, to donate $4.2 million to these gardens. During Bloomberg's administration, uh, we had a promise to have 193 gardens saved. Uh, it's, it's only been a, a spoken promise, and we're still looking to get um, a written promise so that they can become parks and permanently preserved. So permanently preserved, permanent preservation right. is your goal now, but at least uh, they're not threatened at the moment by the Bloomberg administration in the way they once were? Well, still in the last couple of years, one, a beautiful garden that had been founded 30 years ago, uh, Jardin del Pari, uh, excuse me, Esperanza, uh, had been torn down and bulldozed. And a lot of the, the parks and the gardens that have been mistaken for, you know, vacant lots, but had been such a, a focal point in the community, um, they're, they're really prime territory right now to be developed upon. In fact, let's roll this video of some community gardens in the East Village, shot by our producer, Jim Colgan. Can hardly believe that you're in Manhattan, never mind the Lower East Side, the East Village. Do you know what we're looking at here? Yeah, this is the six, uh, six and B Garden. Um, not only is this a beautiful garden in which the neighborhood residents are able to have plots in, uh, it also facilitates a lot of the theatrical performances, children's performances, one of the centerpieces in our pageant. So it's, it is really an important part in the community. And I think we're going to see in a minute one of the very buildings that you were talking about. But beautiful flowers, obviously very well maintained. You could see the whole thing, at least in this case, very, very well kept up. Can't be confused for a vacant lot very easily. Is this the same one? Oh, there's a 6 and B, yeah. Still 6 and B. Is the corner 6 and, and people B. Uh, working and there it is, 6th Street and Avenue B Community Garden and the 6 BC Botanical Garden. What? We're in Manhattan? <laughs> or are we somewhere upstate near New Paltz? <laughs> and is this another, now this building is the one you were referring to before? Uh, that one building is is also where another garden had been torn down and bulldozed. I mean, there's there's at least ten gardens that we visit during the procession and give memorial speeches. Now, now some people will say, uh, look, what we have in New York City that's even worse than a need for garden space is an intense affordable housing shortage. Mm -hmm. And so, if this is public land, then why not have the city develop at least some of it for affordable housing? I understand, but. I guess the community, especially 30 years ago, had been able to turn some of these vacant lots into beautiful, beautiful gardens that had been so important in the community in itself. So it had become such a vital part in the Lower East Side and the East Village that really made it very personable. All right. Rob Polar, Rich Park, Poor Park. How much of a disparity is there today in the funding and therefore the quality of life in New York City parks? Well. Ryan, there's no question that um, the uh, city budget for parks has declined pretty steadily and pretty sharply over, you know, if you look back a decade or two. And um, the city parks department doesn't really deny that. That results in fewer people working in parks, what they used to call parkies, who were kind of a uniform person who would program recreation for kids after school and be the sort of eyes and ears, you know, for the park and look after it. Uh, those, they are out the window. They, the Parks Department um, has replaced uh, a lot of the, filled this hole in, in uh, public funding in a, in a variety of very, you know, interesting ways and, and I think intelligent ways. Um, the argument is, is whether it, it, it offsets all this huge loss of public funding when you use um, private dollars, when you use um, uh, trainees, seasonal workers, part-timers, 
to, to fill this gap. Um, the, the, the argument of certain groups in the city or who, who, who advocate for parks increasingly is that the, the lesser known playgrounds, which are the most numerous around the city in all of the city neighborhoods that are far from Central mm -hmm. Park's glory, uh, do not keep up when it comes to maintenance. So we have a few minutes left. Let me invite our viewers real quick to give us a call and tell us what's broken, what's ugly, what's dangerous in your local park. Name them by name. Who knows? Maybe Rob will do a follow-up story on them. We will definitely transmit them to the Parks Department. Uh, you see the number on your screen, 212-251-0801. And if you don't want to do that, we also invite your videos, your own homemade videos, like the ones we were seeing there, and your uh, photos of the parks in your neighborhood that you think need more attention from the Parks Department. Send us an email. You can email us the photos or the video or just email us how to get in touch with you and we'll follow up and uh, get something that represents your park and pass it along to the Parks Department. Our email address is brian at cuny.tv. That's brian at cuny.tv and you see that on your screen too. Rob, what, what, what are some of the poor parks that you visited for this article? Well, I mean, you could say in a way that Flushing Meadow Corona Park, which is a, the former site of the World's Fair in 1964 as Sprawling Park, is in a sense a poor park. Uh, it's not that it doesn't get attention from the City Parks Department, but um, uh, some of the civic a advocates there decided they were going to start a foundation and to raise private money. But of course, that park is surrounded by, you know, uh, working class neighborhoods for the most part, or middle class neighborhoods, so they don't have the kind of clout of a Central Park West, uh, Central Park, Central Park West Fifth Avenue. They've raised $100,000 <clears> in 18 months, which isn't bad, but you compare that to Central Park where they, get a, they have a budget of $20 million a year coming in from private funds. Let me sneak one in here. It's Celeste in uh, Lower East Side, Chinatown. Celeste, what park? Hi, um, I live on the east end of Canal Street, near Essex Street, mm -hmm. and um, I'm calling about the great disparity between East River Park and the park at Battery Park City. Um, in East River Park, the retaining wall is collapsing into the East River. They've, like, fenced it off with chicken wire. We All right, we're going we're gonna to follow up and take a look at that one, and that is where we have to leave it. So, Nikki, Rob, thank you very much thank for you. coming in to talk about gardens and parks. We're going to follow up on this and do another show with your videos and photos. Thanks a lot for watching Brian Lehrer Live tonight. Next week we'll be back with two of the mayoral hopefuls, Anthony Weiner and C. Virginia Fields. And don't forget to join me on the radio tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and every weekday morning at 10 on New York Public Radio, WNYC-FM and AM, New York Public Radio. I'm Brian Lehrer. Have a great night.